different module. And uh, the lecture, the uh, module is on omics methods and analysis. So in this module, we're going to be covering sequencing, transcriptomics, so that's looking at um, RNA, proteomics, that's looking at proteins, metabolomics, looking at the metabolome. And uh, there's going to be four of us presenting this work too. There's myself, there's Professor Luo, who will cover RNA sequence analysis, uh, Professor Cooper, who will cover proteomics, and Professor Viant, who will cover metabolomics. So um, it's quite handy me kicking this off, really. It fits in quite well with what I talked about this morning. We're going to be looking at uh, DNA sequencing and methods for DNA sequencing, um, and I've already given you some background about why this might be important, and um, I'm going to give you a little bit more in a moment. So we're covering... Um, these topics, essential concepts and methods of DNA and RNA sequencing, I'm going to be doing that in the two lectures today and the two lectures next week. Um, and then looking at genome-wide genome expression data from Professor Luo, proteomics and metabolomics. About 30 hours in total of lectures and tutorials data handling. Yeah. When will this be uh, uploaded on Canvas? Because Can you not? Yeah. Okay, I'll... It's his, it's his responsibility to publish the module. It's the teaching module, yes, and I'm giving it to them. Right. But they haven't, it hasn't worked for me, essentially. Okay. Uh, I can do it, actually. It's very yeah, easy to do. So, <laughs> Yeah, okay. Sorry, I didn't realise that. I, all my lectures are up there, but um, I thought the whole thing had been published. Possibly not. But okay, I'll try and get that sorted for you. Um, in fact, let's just see if we can quickly do it now. So it's published. Oh, wrong one. You're quite right. Check on your phones. Might take a minute to come through. Anyway, that, is that showing up now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to talk in details about the module. I'm not the module leader for this. Um, but there's lots of details on the Canvas pages about what the assessments will be and so on. Okay, so um, the question is, how do you sequence DNA? Also, why do you sequence DNA? I'll be saying a little bit about that. And although... Um, the technologies for using DNA, for, for sequencing DNA these days uh, have advanced a lot. Uh, I'm going to start off covering some of the earlier methods, partly because they are still in use and partly because the concepts in the earlier methods are quite useful when you come to think about the more recent methods uh, and partly because it's interesting to see how people used to sequence DNA. There were two methods published around about the same time in the early 70s for DNA sequencing. One um, called the chain termination me method uh, by Fred Sanger and one chemical method by um, uh, Alan Maxim and Wally Gilbert. I'm only going to be talking about the Sanger method. Maxim Gilbert sequencing is really hardly used by anyone these days and it was never as good a method as Sanger. I've, I've used both. Um, so we're just going to look at the Sanger method today. The first lecture will just cover Sanger um, in the second lecture and also in the third lecture next week, I'll talk about um, the more modern high-throughput methods. So uh, this is Fred Sanger. Um, I mentioned him earlier on in the lecture. He is, or he was, uh, he died recently, sadly, but one of the very few double Nobel Prize winners. So he won two Nobel Prize, uh, Prizes in the 20th century, one for, um, sorry about that, Uh, one for working out the sequence, uh, method for sequencing proteins and one for working out a method for sequencing DNA. This was published, uh, the, the DNA paper was published in 77, um, as you can see here. So 
uh, 40 years ago. Uh, and it's a very um, elegant method. If you can understand this, you'll understand a great deal about uh, how DNA sequencing works as a method. Before I get on to the methods, I want to say a little bit about why anyone should want to do it. You might think it's blindingly obvious, uh, but let's just go, to, go over some of the reasons for doing DNA sequencing. The first and obvious reason is it enables you to identify what we call open reading frames. So an open reading frame is a stretch of DNA that could code for a protein. It starts with a start codon. Uh, that's usually, but not always, an ATG. There are other codons that can be used, but ATG is the most frequent. Um, and it finishes with a stop codon. That might be a TAA, a TAG, or a TGA in frame with the ATG. Okay, so finding a stretch of DNA that looks like that doesn't mean that it does make a protein. It just means that it could make a protein. So here's an example. Um, there's a bit of real DNA sequence. Who can spot the gene in that? It's a little tricky, right? If I say to you, where's the gene, you think, well, where am I supposed to start? So let's just consider um, how we might find the gene in that. You can... OK, well, we'll see if you're right or not, OK, because I'm going to show you how it looks in just a minute. In order to identify the gene in this, you want to translate that DNA sequence. But remember, there's three possible reading frames in which the DNA sequence could be translated. Um, and actually, there's six, because we need to look at it in both, uh, in, on both strands. So let's just look at the top line of that sequence. If we imagine we're translating in reading frame one, that means the first three bases are the first triplet and the next three bases are the next triplet and so on. Um, that's perfectly translatable. You can see um, the amino acids there. Incidentally, we tend to use the single letter amino acid code quite a lot. So if you're not familiar with the single letter code, do try to get used to it. Um, it's, it's a very useful shorthand. Um, and you can see that actually there's two stop codons in there as well. Now, remember, this doesn't mean this is protein sequence. Any random stretch of A, T, Cs, and Gs will give you potential amino acids. It just means that there could be a protein coming in from uh, the left-hand side of the slide and stopping at that first stop codon, maybe. But we don't even know if that's the correct frame. If we shift the frame along by one, so we start off on base two rather than base one, and we read the second, third, and fourth bases... Say so that's the first triplet, um, uh, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh is the, the second triplet, and so on. Obviously, we then get a different sequence because the, uh, the triplets are different. Uh, and now, actually, there's a stop code on in the fourth position, but uh, a stretch of amino acids down here. But no methionine, so it doesn't look as though there's a protein starting in that reading frame. Do the same thing again. We can shift the reading frame along uh, another base. So now the first base is the first. Um, the, the third base is the first triplet, and that gives a stop code on actually straight away. But then we have another string of potential amino acids afterwards. Again, no methionine there, so probably not a protein sequence in there. The point I'm making is that if you just pulled A's, T's, and C's, and G's randomly out of a hat and you laid them out in order, you would see stretches in that that might look like bits of protein. Because by random chance, you'd find stretches where there might be a methionine followed by a bunch of. Um, coding uh, of codons followed by a stop codon. So if you want to identify, and those are all open reading frames, okay? so any methionine followed by a stretch of amino acids followed by a stop codon in a DNA sequence is an open reading frame. It may not represent a, two, a true gene. So it's actually quite complicated to assign a gene to a sequence. But the, the best place that we can start is just to translate the sequence in all the possible reading frames and see if there's anything in there that looks like it might be a gene. And um, you could do that laboriously by hand, but obviously it's much simpler to go to the web. This is the tool that I use all the time, but there's lots of others out there. So if we take that sequence that I just gave you and we translate it in all possible reading frames, starting at base 1 or base 2 or base 3, and we colour in the open reading frames in pink, so all the regions coloured in, in pink start with a methionine, and end with a stop codon, you can see that in frame three, I don't know if this is the one that you spotted, DJ, or not, possibly, uh, there's what looks like a large open reading frame here. So it's a reasonable guess 
that if there is a gene in that sequence, that's probably it. But that doesn't prove it. In order to prove that, you'd need to identify, you'd perhaps make mutations in the DNA and show that um, that had a phenotype, or you'd try and purify the protein and look to see that the N-terminal amino acids corresponded with the gene sequence. But note all these other um, pink stretches here as well. You know, could code for a small peptide? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, here's an interesting one, because we can see there's something starting down here that then runs out of our DNA sequence. So that could be the start of another gene. We don't know. Remember, too, as I just said, that you should also look at the other three reading frames, so on the complementary strand, starting at the opposite end. So DNA can be read from either strand, either the top strand, 5 prime to 3 prime, or the bottom strand, 5 prime to 3 prime. So you always look in both orientations on a DNA sequence to see if there's any, um, anything in there that looks like a coding region. Now, on the bottom strand, as it happens, there's nothing obvious that comes up. So the likelihood is, in that, with that random piece of DNA, that that's probably the gene is this thing here in the uh, third reading frame. But to prove that, you'd need experimental evidence to check it out. So, importantly, the DNA sequence gives you the open reading frames. Those are the potential gene sequences. But note that not all open reading frames are translated into proteins. Note, to the refinements, there are genes that start not with an ATG, but with a GTG, for example. It's rare, but it does happen. Uh, also note that eukaryotic genes make life complicated because they will probably have introns in them that don't code for anything. So that can make it, again, tricky to spot a eukaryotic gene. And that's one of the reasons that even though um, we have the complete genome sequence for humans, but we don't know how many genes there are in there exactly, because it's very hard to predict which of the potential open reading frames are real. Obviously, once we've got the DNA sequence, we can predict the amino acid sequence of the protein. And this is um, important uh, and useful. We're trying to find out what proteins that DNA encodes. We can learn a great deal from that, um, as we talked about in, in, in some earlier lectures, um, although we can't necessarily uh, learn exactly what structure that protein has. The amino acid sequence is a good place to start. It can tell you a lot about the likely properties of the protein, particularly if other people have looked at proteins like it before. So if there are homologs in the databases that you can find, you can look at what the properties of those homologs are and then use that um, to figure out what your protein might be doing. Of course, if there are no homologs, then you've got a problem because you're starting from scratch there's nothing to compare your protein with. And it is still the case that when you're sequencing things, you occasionally come across proteins which don't resemble anything that's ever been seen before. If you're looking, as you often are, at um, sequences which are mutated, the DNA sequence is crucial because the DNA sequence will tell you where those mutations are and it will tell you what changes they will cause in the protein sequence. So again, here's an example. Um, here's... Uh, a gene, uh, it's a wild type gene, it's a human gene, and here's the mutant version of the gene. And I'm sure you all spotted the difference between the two. So again, there's the wild type gene, there's the mutated version of the gene. Where's the difference between them? Uh, you could sit down again, go along uh, base by base if you were so minded, um, but I'll save you the trouble. The difference between those two genes is that the mutated gene has got a deletion of three bases. Um, those three bases encode uh, phenylalanine, uh, F, in the single letter code. <clears throat> and so we know that the protein, the mutated protein, is one amino acid shorter than the wild-type protein. Um, there's the wild-type gene. I've now put a box around the region to look at. And if I move on to the next one, you can see those three of those Ts are disappearing in the, wild, in the mutated gene. Um, you might, again, be able to guess from what we talked about in the last lecture, this is actually the CFTR gene. This is the gene that, when mutated, um, can lead to cystic fibrosis. So that deletion of three amino acids is sufficient to cause the condition cystic fibrosis if you have two copies of the mutated gene. So it's not a big difference between those two genes, but a very significant difference, of course, um, for anyone that has that particular deletion. Once, of course, we've got that deletion, it tells us several things. We know which amino acid has disappeared. We can also use that as a way 
um, if you wanted to diagnose uh, the presence of the CF gene very rapidly, a PCR primer that overlapped with that TTT region would be a very good place to start. So not only does it give you information about the nature of the mutation and the nature of the um, change in the amino acid sequence, it may also give you a diagnostic or potentially, uh, as we discussed earlier, a therapeutic insight as well. There are many, many, many other reasons why we want to look at gene sequences. If you're just doing standard cloning in the lab, um, generally speaking, if we're making plasmids these days, we'll resequence them to make sure that we put things together the right way. If you're doing um, mutagenesis, if you're changing bases to other bases, you're going to need to sequence the gene to check that you've made the mutation that you think you've made. Um, if you're looking for conserved motifs, that is, if you're looking for regions like promoters that may be directing gene expression, or sites that are bound by particular proteins, enhancer regions, all these sorts of things, um, splice sites, if you're looking at eukaryotic genes, the genome sequence or the gene sequence is going to enable you to have uh, a good chance of finding those. And if we're talking about sequencing at the whole genome level, then you're going to be able to look at genome organisation, um, comparing different organisms which are closely related by how their genomes are organised, looking at the evolution of one to the other. So everything right down from just checking whether a particular base has changed in a mutagenesis construct that you've made, right the way up to comparing the genomes of humans and chimpanzees or different forms of yeast or whatever, um, you have to have the ability to sequence DNA in order to make that possible. So... Um, Having given you a bit of a justification for why we might want to sequence DNA, uh, let's talk about how you go about sequencing DNA. And we'll start off with the Sanger method, um, which is, I think, the simplest method. And um, to start that off, I'm going to ask you a, a simple question, which is, if you wanted to carry out a DNA replication reaction in a test tube, um, assuming that you've got DNA polymerase available, what else do you need? Nucleotides. Nucleotides. Apart from nucleotides, what else do you need? You will need some magnesium, that's perfectly true, yeah? Anything else? You don't need ATP. The, the deoxyribo well, you, you've got deoxyribonucleotides in the reaction, so there's no additional form of energy needed for that. I'm still thinking about physical things. You'll need it, it won't work at absolute zero, but uh, you do need warmth. But what, what other physical things do you need? You need a primer. Okay, so you need, you, and, and there's one other key thing that you've, that is kind of the most obvious one of all, template. Okay, so you need a DNA template, which you're making a copy of. You need a primer, which anneals to that template. Without the primer, nothing's going to happen. You need the uh, DNA synthesis precursors, which are the four uh, deoxyribonucleotide triphosphates, so DATP, DTTP, and so on, um, and you need your DNA polymerase. Put those things together in a test tube, you don't need anything else. You will get DNA uh, copying taking place. Okay, so the template's something to, to be copied. DNA polymerase won't work without a template. The precursors for DNA synthesis are needed. You need a short primer. In the cell, that's RNA, but DNA primer will work just as well. Um, and you need suitable buffer and temperature, so that gives you your heat and your magnesium that you suggested. Um, this is the important bit, the fact that you need a primer. If you just put DNA polymerase in a mixture of, with DNA um, and the um, DNA precursors, nothing will happen. You have to have a primer annealed to that DNA template for the DNA polymerase to start with. Um, this is what a DNA replication fork looks like. This is the process that, in a way, we're, we're, we're catalyzing. Um, so remember, with DNA synthesis... The DNA polymerase can only move in one direction along the strand. So at a replication fork, you'll get uh, what's called the leading strand, which will continue to move in this direction, and the lagging strand. And because as this opens up, the DNA polymerase can't move that way, you have a, sheer, a series of short fragments made. And these are called Okazaki fragments, uh, after the guy who discovered them. Each of these has to have its own primer synthesized first. And each of these will subsequently be sealed and the enzyme that does that is DNA ligase um, that you'll be familiar with in the context of um, uh, uh, DNA cloning. But DNA ligase wasn't put on Earth uh, to help us clone DNA. It was put there to seal gaps in replicating DNA. When this happens inside our cells, there's a whole lot of other enzymes as well, like a helicase to unwind the DNA, but 
Um, you don't need that in the test tube reaction. Okay, so if you'd added DNA polymerase and all four DNTPs to a single-stranded DNA fragment in a test tube, would anything happen? I've kind of given you the answer already. Nothing would happen. Why not? No primer, exactly. So you need a primer to be present for anything to take place. Okay, so um, here's an imaginary template, a stretch of DNA. We've made a primer, so the primer is complementary to that stretch of DNA. It's going to base pair with it. And if we mix the primer and the template, because of the base pairs between the A's and the T's and the G's and the C's, they will come together. That primer will anneal to that DNA template, um, as long as you don't heat it up too much. So if you um, add all those things, you will now get new DNA synthesis. I've coloured the novel DNA synthesised in red here, just to make it clean, clearer. So here's your starting point. You've got your template DNA. Here's your primer. You add DNA polymerase. You add the four nucleotide precursors. That will then synthesise the strand of DNA. The strand will stop when it gets to the end of the template. It can't go any further because there's nothing to copy. Okay? Now, this is all stuff that hopefully you know um, from undergraduate work. It's just revision, but you'll see why it's important in just a moment. Just to remind you, DNA polymerase can only work in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. It doesn't work backwards. Actually, that's not entirely true because it does have a, um, a, what's called a proofreading mechanism where it can go back and it can check the base it just put in. So it does have to kind of regress along the DNA for that. But in terms of synthesis, it can't make DNA in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction. It can only go 5' prime to 3'. Prime. The other crucial thing is that the primer has to have a free 3' prime hydroxide group on it for that reaction to take place. So without that 3' prime hydroxide, DNA polymerase can't add anything. Um, and that's simple chemistry. So here you've got a, a very short stretch, a, a TAA trinucleotide. This is the direction you're reading it in, 5' prime to 3'. Prime. There's your free 3' prime hydroxide there. Um, and that's going to be the thing that reacts with the phosphor group in the next precursor as it comes along. So without that, you can't get polymerization taking place. So um, let's imagine a very simple experiment. We take a single-stranded DNA fragment. We take a complementary primer to that fragment. We take all the nucleotide triphosphates. We take DNA polymerase. We mix them together. We add magnesium. We warm them up. And we make one of those um, DNTP precursors radioactive. Uh, having done that, we then run the whole lot down a gel, and we expose the gel to X-ray film. What would we see? What would you see after you did that? Would you see a big smear, or what do you reckon? Would you, see a band? you would see a band. Okay, you're going to get a unique band because you can only make one length here, which is defined by the end of the template. So here's our template strand, here's our primer, here's our newly synthesized strand. This is a stretch of unique length. It's defined at the five prime end by the start point of the primer, which you define because you make the primer, and it's defined at the three prime end by the end of that DNA template. So that is you know, invariant, it's a particular length uh, not larger, not smaller. So if this has been labelled with radioactivity and you run the whole thing down a gel and you expose it to X-ray film and the, the radioactivity will uh, cause exposure of the X-ray film, you'll see a single band corresponding to that fragment. Everyone okay so far? Straightforward stuff, right? Now, Sanger's particular stroke of genius was to realise that if you were to make um, something where you took away that 3' prime hydroxide and you just had a hydrogen atom there, the strand would then terminate at that point if that was incorporated. This looks just like, or almost exactly like, a standard deoxyribonucleotide tri uh, uh, triphosphate. Okay? Structure is exactly the same. The only difference is the lack of that 3' prime hydroxide. So as far as DNA polymerase is concerned, it's going to grab hold of that and put it in opposite to the complementary base. It doesn't look at this bit. It just looks at the whole structure. But if it gets incorporated, 
the strand extension will stop at that point because it's got to have a free three prime hydroxide in order to be added to. So once that's gone in, no more strand synthesis can occur. So let's suppose that we change our reaction by just one thing. We take out the um, deoxy TTP and we put in instead this thing uh, with the missing three prime hydroxide, which is called a dideoxy ribonucleotide. So now we've got deoxy ATP, CTP, and GTP, and we've got dideoxy TTP. What will we see now? Well, I'll answer the question for you because it's so obvious. You're going to get a band again, but it's going to be shorter because it's going to terminate the first time it sticks in that T, which will be, um, correspond to the first A on the template strand. So here's our primer. We start to synthesize, synthesize our DNA strand very happily, but then we stick in a T there because there's an A there, and that strand will stop at that point. It can't go any further because there's no free three prime hydroxide. Okay, so if we ran that down a gel, we'd see a shorter band. So how can we use this to sequence DNA? Well, the clever trick is, let's supposing instead of just putting in the dideoxy, we put in a mixture of the deoxy and the dideoxy. And we can change the ratio of those depending on um, exactly how you want to do the experiment. So what's now going to happen? If you think about this growing strand, it comes to the first A. It might put a deoxy in there, in which case it can continue extending, or it might put a dideoxy, in which case it will stop. So what you'll finish up with in that reaction is a mixture of molecules of different lengths. And the lengths of those different molecules are precisely and unambiguously determined by the position of the A residues in the strand that you're copying. So essentially you'll have something that looks like this. You've got four different length molecules. One is full length. That means it's always put the deoxy T in. This one has terminated at the first A residue, so it's put a dideoxy in there. This one, when it was growing, when it got to the first A residue, it put in a normal deoxy T, just by chance, because there's a mixture of the two. But then when it got to the second one, it put in the dideoxy. And this one uh, put T's in for the first two, but then when it got to the third A, it put in a dideoxy. So you've got four different length fragments um, completely defined by whereabouts the A residues were in the strand which is being copied. So if we run these um, down a gel, uh, a fairly specialised gel, because the difference in these is, is very small, so we use an extremely thin polyacrylamide gel for this, we're then going to get these four bands. Okay? And those bands correspond um, to the position of the A's in the complementary strand or the T's in the newly synthesised strand. Now, obviously, you can do this with any base. So I've talked about doing it with the T's, but you can do it with the A's as well. Um, so let's assume that instead of having um, dideoxy T in there, we have a mixture of deoxy A and dideoxy A. So this is now a separate reaction, and it's a bit more complicated because there's a lot more T's in the complementary strand. Uh, but in this case, we're getting a whole series of different bands Again, terminating at different points, and these different points are determined by where the T's are in the strand that's being copied. And again, um, we can resolve these uh, by electrophoresis, and we're going to see something like this. So up at the top, you've got your biggest band that corresponds to the full-length sequence. At the bottom, you've got this tiny band here where you've only put a couple of bases in before you've terminated at the first T. Okay, so you get the idea. And obviously you can do this with the C's and the G's as well. And as you do that, you're going to build up um, a picture that will look something like this. And then you can just read up the sequence from the bottom. And you're going to go C, A, C, A, G, C, C, G, A, G, and so forth, which is the DNA sequence that you're interested in. Now, this does require ultra-high resolution gels because you've got to resolve fragments which are different in size by only a single base. So each base on this ladder is one base bigger than the fragment before. Um, and so there were some tricks to work out, some technical tricks to work out before people were able to do this because they had to have gels that were um, extremely narrow. They were um, less than a millimetre thick. We used to cast these by hand. It was a real pain. 
um, but you know you got quite good at it after a while, uh, and these would actually resolve individual bases. So in the best um, Blue Peter tradition, here are a couple I did earlier. This, these are you know 30 years old. These pictures. No one does DNA sequencing like this anymore. But this is what the gels actually look like. So these are autoradiographs of sequencing gels from old experiments of mine from many years ago. And you can see it's quite readable. You can, you can read the sequence from this. It takes a while to do it. Um, you get ambiguities like here, for example. It looks like there could be a G in that track. Um, and these sort of things are resolved by sequencing both strands in different directions. Uh, there are certain structures that can cause problems with this method, but for the most part it works extremely well and you can read the sequence quite clearly from those sorts of gels. So it's embarrassing to think how long ago those gels were done. We're talking about back in, back in the um, 80s, I think. Um, over the years, this method, this basic, basic Sanger method, has been refined and improved um, and changed in all sorts of ways. So... Um, here are some of the examples. The people who worked a lot on the DNA polymerases, in the old days, you'd be lucky to get a couple hundred bases before the polymerase fell off the DNA. Um, polymerases now uh, will give much longer reads. It's quite easy to get up to 1,000 bases from a single primer, which used to be very hard to do. Um, there's a lot of modern sequencing methods incorporate PCR steps as well to amplify up the product. Uh, you don't need to make single-stranded DNA. So in the early days of DNA sequencing, everything had to be prepped, um, cloned into a single-stranded uh, bacteriophage and propagated as a, to get single-stranded DNA for sequencing. Uh, you don't need to do that anymore. You can sequence double-stranded DNA. Um, and perhaps most important and useful from a safety point of view, we used to splash radioactivity around the lab like it was going out of fashion. Um, these days, everything's done using fluorescence rather than radioactivity. So the... Um, the, the dideoxy bases are now have fluorophores attached to them, so they fluoresce under the appropriate wavelengths of light, and everything's done without using radioactivity. So a modern sequencing run looks rather different to an old-fashioned sequencing run. Here's the sort of gel I just showed you on the left-hand side. This is what an old Sanger sequencing gel would look like. Um, what now happens is, rather than having all four reactions separate, because you needed one for each base... You can have, now have all four reactions running in the same tube. You just need a different coloured fluorescent marker for each of the four bases that you're using. Um, and then by using a laser and a, a suitable photo detector, you can tell which base is coming off by the wavelength of the emitted light that you get from the base. So you get a readout that essentially looks like a series of uh, peaks like this, or you can um, run it this way. But the result, of course, is exactly the same as if you'd done it on an old-fashioned sort of sequencing gel. It's just a a more refined technique. So uh, on, on a modern, and this is all automated, so on a, a modern automated sequencing machine, um, this is what's going on. You've got your primer and your template. You have your fluorescently labelled didioxys. You have a series of extension reactions, exactly as I've just shown you. These are all run down um, a, a capillary tube, very fine capillary tube. As they run down that tube, they pass through a laser light and that is um, picked up by a detector that measures the fluorescence of the emitted light, goes into a computer, and you get this very nice um, printout at the end. And this is computer-readable. So instead of having someone sitting at a computer laboriously typing in A's, T's, C's, and G's, um, the computer gives you the answer. So here's a more... This is, again, a um, bit of sequence data from the lab. Uh, this is what a good quality sequence from run will look like. And you could, you could read this sequence, but actually the software does it for you, so you can see the sequence at the top there. So there's lots of advantages in doing it this way. Um, it's largely automated, so you're not having to pour gels and do all the reactions yourself. Um, it's all done for you. Uh, you can do many, many reactions in parallel, so a single sequencer can easily run um, hundreds of reactions at the same time. The output's all computer-readable. Uh, you don't need to sit there and read the gel yourself. There's no radioactivity used, which is uh, great from a, a safety point of view. Um, and obviously there's fewer reactions because you're doing one tube rather than four tubes. Um, so essentially what happens, some of you here will definitely do some sequencing as part of your project, and I'm hopeful that some of you will do some sequencing as part of the first practical. But we basically take the sample along to the genomics lab, give it to them, and then a couple of days later the sequence comes back and we have nothing else to do with it. Um, they do everything for us. Um, and it's mostly done by robots. 
Uh, this is the kind of kit you use, so this looks very different from a PhD student pouring gels. Um, and essentially, you put the plate in, press the button, and walk away, and everything else is done automatically. Um, and as well as sequencing, resequencing, there's lots of other things that these um, machines can do. But all of it is to do with generating DNA sequence that you can subsequently analyze. We're not talking about the, the, the fine details of what goes on in here, but essentially it's quite easy to run multiple reactions in parallel. So you'll put in, uh, in the machines that we've got, generally speaking, a 96-well plate, and in each of those 96 wells there will be a different sample, and each one of those will go through a full sequencing reaction. Um, that's then taken on these capillaries through the UV detector and read. So instead of doing one sequence at a time, the machine will be doing 96 sequences at a time. So you've increased your output almost by two orders of magnitude, just by automating that process and having lots of things running in parallel. And this idea about collecting lots of information in parallel is going to be really key when we think about Illumina sequencing, which is what I'll cover um, in the next lecture. Okay, so that's the basic idea of DNA sequencing. Does anyone have any questions about that before I move on? Is everyone okay on the, the basic principles? And some of you have probably done this as part of your undergraduate projects, I imagine. Right, so it all seems really simple. Okay, the process is quite straightforward. I've just told you that all you've got to do is take your solution along to the genomics lab. They'll do the sequencing for you. Let's um, begin to think about how this might actually apply in practice if you wanted to sequence a stretch of un unknown DNA. So here's our DNA of unknown sequence. You've, you've cloned a piece of DNA, okay, for whatever reason. You've done a PCR reaction or whatever, you've cloned this into a plasmid, you want to know the sequence because you want to know, is there an open reading frame in there? Is my mutation in there? What, what's that sequence got in it? So, in order to sequence it, of course, we need a primer. Well, that's okay. We know what the sequence of our plasmid is, so we can make a primer with anneals to the plasmid, and we can sequence it. But there's a problem. Supposing we've cloned 4 or 5 KB here, and we only get, let's say, 500 bases from our sequence. Great, so we know what the first 500 bases is, but we don't know anything about this sequence down here. Now, we could make a primer for up here and sequence in that way. That gives us another 500 bases, but there's still this gap of unknown stuff in between. How are we going to get to that unknown sequence? Well, we can't design primers to any of this lot because we don't know what the sequence is. So to make the primer, we need to know the sequence that we're making it complementary to. But now we do know this sequence. We've got that from our first sequencing experiment. So we can design a primer which is complementary to this sequence and extend that a little bit further to make a new primer based on our new sequence. And now we can go further through. And then we can keep on doing that until eventually we hit plasmid sequence and we know that we've sequenced right the way through this piece of DNA. And this is perfectly fine. It works well but it's really slow because we've got to make the primer and get the sequence and until we've got the sequence we can't design the next primer then we've got to order the primer we can order them online but it's going to take two or three days to arrive get the next sequence so to get through this three or four kilobases we're talking about two or three weeks just to get the primers made and get the next bit of sequence and so on it works fine but it's very laborious it's also expensive because you know, you've got to pay for each of these individual primers. And although you might choose to do this with a chunk of three or four kilobases, if you're faced with a genome, even a bacterial genome, you've got a thousand times that amount of sequence. You've got three or four megabases of DNA to get through. So there's really not a great deal of point in trying to sequence a genome this way. If the people who started sequencing bacterial genomes um, in the late 80s had started this way, they'd still be at it. They'd still be laboriously walking their way around the chromosome, making new primers every two or three days. Uh, it really wouldn't have been a good way to do it. So we need a method that's going to work with um, bigger pieces of DNA. And this is the great breakthrough uh, that, that Ventner, Ventner came up with, um, the example I gave you this morning about the Haemophilus genome. What Ventner said was, let's not worry about walking from one place to the next. Let's just break the whole thing into small bits and sequence all of those small bits and then join them back together again. Okay, so uh, the people in, in Venter's lab took 
genomic DNA from um, Haemophilus, broke it into small pieces um, by sonication, so using high-frequency sound waves, which, which fragments DNA. And they cloned each fragment into a plasmid, and they sequenced each individual fragment. Now, that's all well and good, but you've then got thousands and thousands and thousands of random bits of sequence. What you've then got to do is put them back together again. So you've got to find the overlaps between them to put them back together. Because if you've, if you've got random bits of, of, of sequence, um, completely random, by chance, bits of them will overlap with each other. I'll, I'll show you an example so in just a second. One sequence yeah, but you've, but you've not just got one chromosome. You've got, if you make genome DNA from a bacterium, you've got millions and millions of copies of that oh, genome okay. DNA, and you're breaking each, each of those randomly. Yeah. So here's an example. Here's some short fragments of a sentence. What I want you to do is put them back together to find the correct final sentence. So look for the overlaps and reassemble those. Remember, I give out chocolate bars as prizes, so the first person that can come up with the sentence. How do you find the biotechnology LSV interesting and enjoyable? Very good. OK. <laughs> So you can see what we've done here. We've looked for overlaps between each of these individual fragments, and we've got an unambiguous sentence from that. But remind me to buy a bar of CDM at some point. OK, so this is the basic idea. You take your genome sequences, you fragment them, you sequence these small bits, you look for places where they overlap, and you then reassemble them. Now, that actually wasn't too hard. You had one, two, three, four, you had six or seven fragments to reassemble. We're talking about fragments of maybe two or three hundred bases here, or maybe five or six hundred if our sequencing is working really well. Um, it doesn't take a great deal to realize that this is going to be quite a problem. The EQI genome has got around about as many bases as there are letters in the complete works of Shakespeare. So let's imagine someone said to you, I, I want you to put together the complete works of Shakespeare. I'm going to start off with 10,000 copies of the complete works. I'm going to rip them up into tiny little shreds, all of them three or four hundred letters long, and your job is to put them back together again into the complete works of Shakespeare. You would probably hesitate before taking on that job. Okay, that would be a massive amount of work to do. And that's because you're not a computer. Actually, you are in some ways. Um, but this is the kind of thing that computers are really good at. They don't mind being bored to tears, and they're very, very good at pattern matching. You could do it if you had the time and nothing else to do with your time, you wouldn't choose to do it, but a computer can. The human genome is around about 1,000 times bigger than the E. coli genome. So that's equivalent to taking a very large library, or actually several thousand copies of the very large library, and taking every single book in that library and ripping it into tiny shreds, and then trying to put the library back together again. You can begin to see the magnitude of that task from a computational point of view. It is colossal. It's a really, really hard computational task. It's even more complicated than actually reassembling Shakespeare or reassembling the library. First of all, remember sequences will be from either strand. Okay? You can sequence the top strand or the bottom strand in either direction. So it's not all reading in the same direction. If you've got a double-stranded piece of DNA, let's go back to earlier picture. Here, you can sequence in this direction, or you can make a primer here, and sequence in that direction. Okay, so you've got sequences from both strands, which makes life complicated because it means half your sequences are complementary with the other half. And um, with the complete works of Shakespeare, you could begin to see when it was starting to make sense. You know, you get sensible sentences out. With the DNA sequence, all you've got is A, T, C's, and G's. So there's no easy way of saying, is this making sense or not? Because you don't have recognizable sentences at the end of it. That becomes a little bit less true if you know in advance um, something about the genome, because then you can look for particular um, genes appearing. But if you don't know that, uh, it's not possible. It is the case that not every single sequence, sequence can be cloned. There are some sequences which are very unstable when they're put into bacterial plasmids. So if your method involves sequencing things cloned in plasmids, you're never going to be able to get those. There's, there's no way, if they can't be cloned, that you can sequence them. Again, there are ways of doing it, but not through the plasmid cloning route. 
And a real problem is when you run into repetitive DNA. Because if you run into a stretch of repetitive DNA, and that DNA is repeated elsewhere in the genome, and then you come out of it on the other side, you don't know whereabouts you are. It's like going through a portal. Okay, so supposing you've got runs of T's at several different places in the genome, and suppose those runs of T's are bigger than an individual sequence. So you'll finish up with lots of sequences which are just T's. So how do you know which bits of sequence on either side of those T's fit together? There's no way that you can tell just by doing this kind of assembly. And all of these are problems, which are very real problems when it comes to um, assembling a complete genome. And actually, most of, the complete, most of the genomes that are now published are not complete. They've got gaps in them. Most of the genomes that are now published are kind of 95, 98% complete, which is good enough but we don't actually have completely assembled genomes. Um, as far as I know, there is still no one single completely assembled human genome because the human genome is heaving with repetitive DNA. And we don't really care if there's 5,742 copies of an alu element or 5,926 copies of an alu element. It doesn't really matter that much. So to get a complete sequence of a complete genome, possible with bacterial genomes and, and smaller genomes like that, with um, larger, more complex genomes, we generally don't completely bother. So it's a big computational um, problem to solve. It requires a lot of uh, extremely powerful computing power to do. Um, and there are issues with it in, the, in repetitive DNA and unclonable sequences and so forth. Nonetheless, this is basically the method by which genome sequencing is now done. So all the methods... Uh, with one exception, which I'll come on to um, in Lecture 3, uh, the methods I'm going to talk about involve breaking genomes or, or sequences of DNA into very short regions, um, sequencing those, and then putting them back together again in a complete genome. And that's referred to as genome assembly, um, the method sometimes called shotgun sequencing, because you're shotgunning these very small um, fragments into a plasmid uh, or using PCR fragments for doing the sequencing. Now, what I did refer to is a refinement of this, which is if you already know something about the genome, if you've got, for example, a restriction map of the genome, or you've got close homologues where you know what the orders are, you can use that as a reference to assemble your short reads on. And this is referred to as a scaffold. So you've got, for example, a partial map of the genome and based on some other information. You can then see whereabouts your pieces fit. It's rather like a, a, a jigsaw puzzle where the shape of the jigsaw has been cut out of a block of wood, and you know your jigsaw's got to fit into that. Um, you can shotgun sequences with no knowledge about the genome at all, but it's likely to be gappy. There are likely to be some breaks in that that you don't cover in your sequencing. So the second method is easier from a computational point of view, but you need prior knowledge of the genome. The first method, you need no prior knowledge, but you're not necessarily going to get complete genome coverage. So there's pros and cons to both methods. By and large, most of the sequencing we're going to talk, to talk about is the former method. Now, when it came to the Human Genome Project, it was interesting because both of these methods were used. So there was uh, a race, essentially, um, between a company called Celera uh, and what was called the International Human Genome Consortium, which was a, a big alliance of lots of labs, in, mostly in Europe and, and the States. Um, the International Genome Consortium already had a, a kind of rough idea of, of the human genome. They had a lot of information um, from restriction mapping, and they generated more information to generate a scaffold which they could then assemble their small reads onto. Um, Solera said, no, we're not going to bother with that. We're just going to take lots of random fragments, and we're going to write very smart software that can assemble this into a complete genome project. Uh, Solera was run by, wouldn't you know it, our friend Craig Venter, um, and it was a very difficult and controversial time. There was a quite bad feeling between the different groups, particularly because as soon as the um, International Consortium uh, got information about the scaffold, they published it, put it into the public domain. So actually, Venter was able to use that in his so-called totally random de novo assembly. Uh, and if you talk to people involved in the project, there's still a little bit of bad feeling about it. Uh, but at the end, there was an agreement that everyone should publish their results simultaneously, so no one claimed priority. It took around about 13 years to complete, cost about 3 billion American dollars 
to complete, which is you know, a, a large amount of money um, by, by anyone's estimation. Um, it's now pretty routine to sequence genomes for less than $1,000. So the cost has come down um, more than a million fold in the intervening 20 years or so. This is partly done by just churning out data at very, very high levels. So there's lots of places around um, in, in um, Europe, in the States, and, and China in particular, with these sequencing centers where they just have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these machines all running flat out 24-7, churning out um, sequence data, and have a lot of very sophisticated software and some very hard-working um, bioinformaticians putting this sequence data together. Um, and so this is sequencing essentially by brute force, uh, and it does work, and it's been extremely powerful. Um, but actually, even if you've got loads of sequencing machines, this is still quite slow. It's, it's still a relatively slow process. You're still, um, you know, each machine is doing maybe 96 sequences in a run. Perhaps you do three runs a day. Perhaps you've got 100 machines. Um, you need, if you're, going to do, if you're going to drive down the cost of genome sequencing, you need a method that's much cheaper and much more rapid than the Sanger method. So the Sanger method was kind of pushed to the limit. People um, came up with lots of refinements and automation, um, but the need was to move on to a method that was going to be cheaper. And all of these, there are several methods which have been devised for this, all of these rely on this idea of, of doing many, many, many reactions in parallel. Uh, I showed you the example of the sequencer that was running maybe 96 machines in parallel. The way that sequencing works nowadays, you will run hundreds of millions of reactions in parallel rather than 96. So although the actual sequencing steps may not be any further, the amount of sequence data you generate is much, much higher, purely because so many reactions are running in parallel. There are several methods for doing this. Um, what I'm going to talk about is probably the main the method that's mostly used, which is the Illumina method, and um, we'll get on to another method later on. Uh, this is not the only one, but it's, it's the one that's become sort of the industry standard. Right, I'm going to take a break at that point, because it's a long session, this, um, so we'll take a five or ten minute comfort break there. Um, you can catch up with your notes, and I'm going to grab a coffee, uh, and then we'll start again at three.